All right, so we want to welcome back our good friend, Dr. Jude LeClaire. And her talk today is going to be, what delicious moment is this? This is interesting, so can't wait to hear this. So uh, thank you for coming back and joining us again, Dr. Jude. And a little bit about her uh, bio here is uh, Dr. Jude, she brings over 50 years of experience as a mental health counselor, author, and educator. Uh, she's published uh, the Life Weaving Education Curriculum, um, a holistic problem solving curriculum, and writes a monthly mental health article for Evolving Magazine. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Jude still enjoys working as a counselor and being active in social justice issues and actions. So thank you, Dr. Jude. We are certainly welcome uh, and, and uh, thankful to have you back to share your knowledge and wisdom with us. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Jude, take the floor. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm real glad to see all of you again. And I, I'm sure since we last met, I know each of you, just as I have, have had your life moving forward. And some of you, all probably all of you, facing some kind of challenges every day, right? So as I was really thinking about talking to you, I had just so many thoughts and feelings kind of randomly tumbling through this popcorn brain of mine. Because I know that you're, I, when I get the invitation to speak to you, I know, okay, I'm speaking to a group of very exceptional people in my mind who are choosing to stay active, who are informed and involved. So I know that I that I really need to think clearly and deeply about what I might have to share with you, because I know you have many things to share with me. So, uh, so I know that each of you in your own way, I know you're working every day to try to be a more positive and probably active and involved person, changing or growing as you as you are. Right? You're not sitting here stagnating, or you or you wouldn't be sitting here paying attention and doing this. So it always seems to me that the inner and outer world, at least in mine, goes kind of runs from one thing to another and sometimes very chaotic ways. And so it's like we know that we all kind of experience the joys and the sadnesses, the peace, the war, the stormy, the sunny weather, the losses and the nurturing connections that we're all experiencing that. So this is the sort of changing inner and outer landscape of our lives. And it doesn't stay the same from moment to moment, does it, or day to day. So how do we stay, how do we find some sense of groundedness and sanity? So I thought about some in the last even six months or year, what what are what were sort of some sort of moments that caught my attention? And um uh, I gave, and that also gave me some sense of joy. So I will just share a few of those with you and maybe you can think about some of yours. So last year, as I was, this was last spring actually, I was walking in the park. I stopped to talk to this woman that was working in the butterfly garden. There's a little butterfly garden that this little man that I knew, just talked with had gotten some little bit of funding for and planted things that, butterflies like which is great and I'm sure some of you have done the same thing so I was talking to her and and I saw this sort of strange bird with mottled coloring and I asked her if she knew uh what kind of bird it was and she said it was a piebald robin now I know some of you may have asked her you know you may know uh, about piebald, I didn't. She showed me a picture of it on her phone. And later on in looking it up, I found that there were many piebald animals, like piebald horses and you know various birds and other animals and so on, and deer and so on. And actually some Native Americans believe that if you kill a piebald deer, you're going to have bad luck, that you yourself might die. It's not good luck to kill a piebald deer. They, th they saw them as very special. When I looked up the piebald robin, I found that it is only about one in 30,000. And I thought, wow, I, I just was in such wonder that I got to see 
this bird. And I went back to the park when, uh, several times after that. I never saw it again. I saw people who said, oh, yes, I see that bird often. I used to go every day to that park. I don't now as much. And hopefully next spring, it's a robin. I'm hoping it'll come back, that, that the robin will come back. There's a group of them. And they told me in what tree they live. So, but it was just such a kind of a amazing, it just made me feel good. that you know? <laughs> I saw this sort of amazing thing on my walk. And about a month later, I was, we have a screened in back porch and I saw what I thought was a hummingbird on our screened in back porch, which seemed fairly odd to me. We have, do have one screen that has a hole, you know, is loose. And so sometimes the birds get confused and come swooping into our porch, which is okay. We have to open the little door and let them out. So anyway, so I saw this uh, thing that I thought it was flapping its wings real fast, rapidly, and it looked like a hummingbird. And then it landed on the screen. And then I saw another one. And it was sort of a triangle shaped thing. Well, that's not a hummingbird. And uh, so I, 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 after some searching, I identified it as a white lined sphinx moth. Have you ever seen one of those? Well, evidently they're quite common in the United States and in the Midwest. I'd never seen one. Yep, you know, I didn't know what it was. Uh, it's very beautiful. And it turns out that four of them were all in our, our screen porch. So we tried kind of like opening the door and helping them out to fly away. Uh, so they could go out and do whatever they needed to do. They, they're pollinators, so that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so I don't know if, if any of you ever seen a white sphinx, uh, white lined sphinx moth. No, <laughs> well, they're supposedly very common, but I certainly had never heard of them and never seen one. They're quite beautiful. Their wingspan is like two to three inches. They're not tiny either. So. As I see things like that when I, you know, just sitting on my porch or walking, and as as I, you know, this spring, summer, and this last fall, it's like there's some moments that I was experiencing, and I kept the word that kept coming to me was delicious. Like it just seemed like this is a delicious day. Look at the sun is shining, or it's a, it's a beautiful rainy day, even or the leaves are beautiful. The trees are beautiful. Now they're kind of all naked, but it's you know the it, it, there's just something about the air, about the what you see, what you hear. It just felt delicious to me, and that word kept coming back, delicious. Which it may seem a bit odd, but it's like <laughs> that's how I felt about these experiences. That it seemed to me to be delicious. So it seemed like I was experiencing, like I said, all these things in a rich, delicious moment. And, and you know, given what's going on, uh, you know, with our world today, I think delicious moments are important. Seeing piebald robins or white line sphinx moths or whatever else it might be, right? So. Fast forward to the Writers' Conference at the Johnson County Library this month. And I, I was sort of reticent about going to it. I went last year, but every time I decide to go, I think, oh, why am I going? I'm a nonfiction writer. It's mostly about fiction. I don't really write fiction. Uh, it's a big group of people. It's not my thing to go to big groups of people. But anyway, I get in the car. I go to the, you know, I had, a, I had of course, enrolled for it. And I ended up going to a, a several workshops on poetry. Now, I don't know, have any of you ever dabbled in writing poetry? I see a hand or two. I, I, I have since college, but never except just for myself. I did take a poetry class, so I had to write for that. But um, I just do it for myself. But I've always loved poetry and I've always thought that poet, poetry was uh, something that was inspiring. And it also kind of helps me to experience life in a different part of my brain. 
So as I ended up kind of, I don't know, I'd be sitting talking to people and they said, I'm going to this workshop. I'm going, oh, fine. I didn't say anything else that piqued my interest. So I'll, I'm going to that workshop with them. So, so I went to this one on poetry and basically imagery with food. And uh, so what, what kind of kept going through my mind as I'm experiencing uh, this these workshops is that kind of emotionally and viscerally the power of being sort of in this sensory moment. And I think even though I practice this as a therapist, I forget it for myself sometimes. <laughs> and I forget about doing it for something other than helping a person with their emotions, like just for the sake of being present to everything. And some of you may have heard this in your travels, but Fritz Perls, who is kind of the gestalt uh, guru in the 60s, 70s, even in the 80s, I think, made the statement that I've never forgotten, lose your head and come to your senses. So most of us get lost in this, you know, running around in our brain thinking, right? And or I don't know about you, but I get in circular patterns <laughs> right in my brain, and often not terribly productive. So what it reminded me of is that the senses are the pathways to the self, to our thoughts, to our feelings, to our inner being, that you start with the body. And of course, all the training I had was body-mind. You start with the body, you start with the sensory experience. But I kind of forget it sometimes in just the wonderment part, paying attention, not for a purpose of helping a person heal their trauma, which is, I'm not saying that what isn't wondrous as well at times, but it's also, you know, that's a little bit different than than experiencing the piebald robin or the you know the white line sphinx moth or you know just experiencing the joy of this moment as i'm usually it's through nature not always but often okay so i think the sensory moment invites us opens us up to this moment right that is really that key to ourselves to our inner selves, to our beings, all right? So, uh, so I thought what I would do a little bit different today. I have a lot of poems that I wanna share with you. <laughs> Not mine, fortunately for you. Uh, I don't know, some of you obviously, but I bet are familiar with Mary Oliver. How many of you know about Mary Oliver? I kind of got turned on to her some time ago and I thought, oh my goodness, she's pretty amazing. So there, this is a poem of this is a poem of Mary Oliver's, uh, which it really kind of talks about this process uh, of the connection of really what you're experiencing to more of that sense of yourself and connection even with the spiritual. The title of the poem is, "Where does the temple begin? Where does it end? There are things you can't reach." but you can reach out to them and all day long. The wind, the bird flying away, the idea of God. And it keep, can keep you as busy as anything else and happier. The snake slides away and the fish jumps like a little lily out of the water and back in. The goldfinches sing from the unreachable top of the tree. I look. Morning to night, I'm never done with looking. Looking, I mean, not just standing around, but standing around as though with your arms open and thinking, maybe something will come, some shining coil of wind or a few leaves from any old tree. They're all in this too. And now I will tell you the truth. Everything in the world comes at least closer and cordially, like the nibbling, tinsel-eyed fish, the unlooping snake, little gold finches, little dolls of gold fluttering around the corner of the sky of God, the blue air. So I, I don't think, I, I certainly could never say that 
in any better way, right? So, so as I, I'm going to read the next poem. And what I'd like for you to do is maybe just kind of close your eyes and listen and wander, let your mind wander to a sensory experience that grabbed your attention and took you to another place. The title is Just a Minute, said a voice. Just a minute, said a voice in the weeds. So I stood still in the day's exquisite early morning light, and so I didn't crush with my great feet any small or unusual thing just happening to pass by where I was passing by on my way to the blueberry fields. And maybe it was the toad, and maybe it was the june beetle, and maybe it was the pink and tender worm who does his work without limbs or eyes and does it well. Or maybe it was the walking stick, still frail and walking humbly by, looking for a tree. Or maybe, like Blake's wondrous meeting, it was the elves carrying one of their own on a rose petal coffin away, away into the deep grasses. After a while, the quaintest boy said, thank you. And then there was silence. For the rest, I would keep you wondering. So just take a moment to stay with your experience. What do you see? Perhaps something you hear. Something that you can touch. Or taste even. Or smell. Just be with this. Just take it in. Where does it take you into time, space, your emotions, your thoughts and feelings? Would anyone, would anyone be willing to share their experience? It, it took me, Jude, to a place we were once off Chile, Magdalena Island, where there was penguins and they had the right of way. Everything. <laughs> so you just had to be so aware. So it just really took you outside of yourself because you were only thinking about them. Right. right. Where they are you know, where they were. And it was just so amazing to just watch them have the run of the place. Right, yeah. Yeah, watching animals behave is kind of an awesome experience. Anybody else? For me, it was a, um, a very hard running stream slash gorge in Montana that no matter when you go, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, it is still just powerful and rushing and um, just what's going through that water and how does it keep going? And <laughs> I don't know. It, it, and I love the sound. I mean, I could just sit and listen to it all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I live on a lake and <clears throat> the way the sun glances off the water uh, at different times of day just amazes me. And uh, right now the sun is lower than it would normally, well, normally it is at this time of year and um, it sparkles. Yes. So there's this sparkle that comes uh, from the lake and then it comes into like right behind me here yeah. and is up on the wall. Yes. It's, yeah. I, I think, you know, maybe I've smoked too much marijuana or something. <laughs> no, uh, it's just, it's <laughs> just remarkable. It just keeps me entranced. Well, Jeff, I would say that, you know, that your experience is one that I think 
we often have. And maybe one of the things of getting a little bit older is that we do pay more attention. We do take more time to pay attention and kind of wonder at these things and to kind of take it in and let us feed, let those moments feed us in some way, right? Okay. Anybody else have something they'd like to share? No, I, I had one just it came to mind that was yesterday. I was out walking through this heavy forest on my property, and there was a peregrine falcon with blue wings just flew, landed, and then flew off. And so when you were reading the poem, I knew I had to be present just for that two seconds. Mm -hmm. I had to quit being busy and see it mm -hmm. because it was gone just like that. Yes. But I saw it. Yes, yes, yeah. Good. Yeah, we have to kind of be aware, don't we? We do have to kind of, I love what you said, you know, but the, we're kind of open. If we're open and we're open to wondering, then we can experience those moments, right? We can experience those moments with whether it's birds or leaves or the wind or the water, right? We know that even pictures of nature help people feel better. Sounds of water help people feel better. If we're out in it, it's even more important and more amazing because it feeds us in even a very different way. I said here, this is where I sit when I do my virtual appointments, which I don't have a whole lot of anymore, but I still have a few. And we have a little dog yard with a dog fence. And so actually I do see, we have a pair of hawks in um, white-tailed hawks that, that live in the neighborhood. So sometimes one will come sit on the fence here as I'm you know, sitting talking to somebody. But and you're right, they don't cut they don't stay very long, do they? <laughs> They're very busy. <laughs> They're very, very busy. Anybody else have something they want to share? So I think this kind of gives you an idea that these are moments that can help change our perspective. They can help us find, I think, sometimes a new sense of calmness and peace. Uh, maybe a different way of being with ourselves, kind of resetting the experience. And we think about it in this global world that kind of presents sometimes too much information and unfortunately a lot of disinformation with often very little true perspective, it kind of stays hard to be a caring, positive person. So I, I have found perhaps you have that it, it is in this moment I live, here and now, that creates my life and changes the environment. One of the kind of sayings in Buddhism is, if you don't like your environment, change yourself. But I think one of the things that has often helped me change myself is that moment, right? Uh, that moment uh, that connects us with something that seems large in ourselves and yet it's this small thing right whether it's the water it's this bird it's this you know this beautiful sunset it's something that grabs us and says who there's something some, something very much bigger than myself that's speaking to me through all these 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 creatures and beings and, and you know trees and plants and so on right Okay, so I think if we're if we're if we're listening, right? If we're if we're listening, so it is being in that moment that sometimes I think helps us to look at the tougher, harder things. You know, so I I I like Bill Moyers. One of the books I have is this book called The Language of Life, the Festival of Poets, and uh, so. Um, this woman, this woman, her uh, her name, or this man, excuse me, W.S. Merwin, wrote a poem called Place. And uh, it kind of puts those ideas together. It says, on the last day of the world, I would want to plant a tree. What for, not for the fruit, the tree that bears the fruit, it is not one that was planted, I want the tree that stands in the earth for the first time 
with the sun already going down and the water touching its roots in the earth full of the dead and the clouds passing one by one over its leaves. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's uh, kind of an amazing way to think about it. On the last day of the world, you know, there, I mean, I'm, I don't think this is the last day, but we also, I think we are probably heading towards extinction <laughs> on this planet, <laughs> but it's like, it won't be in our lifetimes and maybe for a few more after that. But nevertheless, life is going on, right? Life is eternal. So even though it might feel to you like it's the last day of the world, <laughs> perhaps we would plant a tree, right? <laughs> what do you think that represents? Hope, don't you think? That life goes on. Yes. That life goes on in whatever form it takes. Life goes on. Hopefully, I don't know where you are, but perhaps you believe your life goes on in some way, in some form, in, in some manifestation. You know, even quantum physics kind of hints at life is eternal. The, the universe is boundaryless. We don't know the beginning. We don't know the end. So if we feel despair, perhaps, you know, planting a tree might might be... <laughs> Might be the best thing to do, right? <laughs> right. Um, another poem that I I thought was very good. This woman and I had not seen any of her poetry. She was in. It was in this book by. Uh, it's in. She wrote a poem called Ars Poetica. Her name is Clarabel Allegria, and uh, she's a survivor of the war in El Salvador. She came to this country as a political refugee. So she says, I, poet by trade, condemned so many times to be a crow, would never change places with the Venus de Milo while she reigns in the Louvre and dies of boredom and collects dust. I discover the sun each morning and, and amid valleys, volcanoes, and debris of war, I catch sight of the promised name. So I think sometimes it's it's helpful to listen to people who have been through different, you know, hard things, because I know that some of you have also are going and have been through hard times. How do we do that? How do we keep seeing the sun when there is war, when there is, you know, not to jump into despair, not to s jump into hopelessness? but to find some way to see the promised land, so to speak, that exists within us. There's a concept in Buddhism called 3,000 realms in one moment. And it actually talk, gets kind of a metaphorical way of talking about the 3,000 worlds represent all the aspects of life that all exist in one moment. That in any given moment, all reality future and past without beginning or end exists within us. And so the concept that I learned in Buddhism of 3,000 realms in one moment, moment kind of says it to you is, you know, Eastern Indian metaphors are very, you know, they, they really have a lot of, they really have a lot of metaphors <laughs> about some philosophical ideas, right? And very rich in the tradition. But I thought, you know, that's in this, Buddhism, of course, came from India, and then this particular Buddhism came through Japan. So thinking about it in that way helped me. I don't know what helps you to understand, or just kind of, I can't, I can't say understand. I believe that there are, that this moment is the eternal moment. And it speaks to us, the eternal moment speaks to us through Mostly, I think, would be sensory experiences and, and I think connections, of course, with people who are part of that world. And I think it keeps us awake to that reality and it keeps us hopeful. It keeps us in that moment of saying, oh, you know, 
that even though I'm having this experience or I'm in a dark space, that there's some way out, that there's some way to, to be more positive. The other day I was kind of feeling very cranky and very tired and I thought, it was kind of a nice day. It's been you know, unseasonably warm. I said, I'm, I'm walking to the park and I'm not gonna walk fast, I'm gonna walk slowly. And I'm just gonna be open to whatever I see and whatever I hear. And then there's a couple of benches in the park and I just sat and I just, just listened to the sounds, the dogs, the birds, the leaves, the wind. And it's, people came by with dogs and I petted the dogs. And it's like, I just allowed myself to take a breath, slow down. And by the time I was walking home, I felt energized. I felt happier. And I was, huh, I didn't, wasn't dragging my feet. <laughs> so, you know, I think finding ways like that, finding ways to connect, all right, with, I mean, it's here, isn't it? You, you you can't do anything. I'm sitting here looking out my window at all these trees and leaves and the cars of the people next door and and uh, our bird feeders and you know I have this little these little I have this I don't know what you'd call it I guess it's some sort of a yard decoration but anyway there's these little things with cup metal cups when it blows it they turn in the wind so I always know how how windy it is by whether my little things are turning around how much they're turning around whether a few of now of course there's nothing so it's there's no wind <laughs> but some days it's a few then when it's really windy all of them are spinning around at once right so you know it's like I just think I have paid you know the, the reminder for me of paying attention to those things. And I went back and I thought of this. I, I, I was in my, in my youth, I was a Robert Frost fan and I still have my uh, book of uh, the poetry of Robert Frost <laughs> that I have not let go of. And this is one that I've kind of remembered one of the lines. It's called Dust of Snow. Some of you may be familiar with it. I see you nodding, you. The way a crow shook down on me the dust of snow from a hemlock tree has given my heart a change of mood of a day I had rued. <laughs> so I think sometimes it it's uh it that's what happens, right? to us as that sometimes as we're moving along, something sort of grabs us, you know, walking into my office and somebody grabs the door and holds it open for me. And there's a, a car, some chiropractors in my building that's, that, that see mostly Spanish speaking folks. And a lot of times they don't speak English. Uh, and so it's like, you know, we see they're coming in and out of the building and a lot of times they can't find the office. But anyway, so that, you know, it's very lovely. And, you know, I, you know, I'd like to thank you. And they smile and I smile and it's like, whew, that just makes me feel so good. Right. <laughs> right. I think I've mentioned this. Maybe I've mentioned this to you. Maybe you read there was a interview on PBS several. Oh, I don't know. It's been six months ago, maybe. And they were talking to this young boy who is about 16. And. Uh, his, he was adopted, he and his sister, and they'd had very tragic, traumatic childhood. And the mother was very uh, concerned that he was only worried you know, about himself, that he wasn't really into being aware of other people. And she said, when you go, we go to church on Sunday, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to hold the door for somebody. So he's going, ah, well, I don't know, whatever, I'll hold the door for somebody. So... He goes to church on Sunday. He opens the door for somebody and they were very happy and thanked him and he, it made him feel good. So he said, then I started opening doors all the time for everybody. <laughs> and it made me feel better and better. Eventually, this young man has started a support group for other teens who have been traumatized. So sometimes that small thing, right? Opening the door. <laughs> however we open the door right either receiving because receiving is important as well as giving 
So if somebody, I used to think, well, I, I don't need anybody to open up that for me. I'm, I'm not crippled. But it's like, you know what? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You know, it's like, take it in, Jude. It's okay to let somebody do something for you. Okay. It's hard for me to receive. So receiving from other people, receiving just what's out there, right? And what I've experienced is that I, if I allow myself, it's probably a little less threatening to do it in nature than it is with people, <laughs> right? To do that receiving, right? So what I would say is, as you kind of begin to consider taking some time each day, and maybe some of you already do, you probably have a daily practice of meditation or something like that. But taking time to just look out the window, taking a walk, and really looking at your sensory environment. To take a moment to find that delicious aspect of this experience. Paying attention to your senses, breathing, taking a moment, being present, maybe writing some things down about it. So I, I went to a fairly joyous memorial service last week. Some of you may have known this woman, M.K. Mustard. She was fairly well known around the Kansas City community. She was pretty much involved in almost everything. <laughs> she was 86, and it, oh, about six months ago, I guess she found out that she had inoperable cancer and went into hospice. But anyway, so she had an opportunity. She was one of those people that was just kind of infectious in her way of, you know, being. And she had this poem read at her memorial service. And as some of you may know about it. It's been around for a while. Yes, by William Stafford. It could happen any time. Tornado, earthquake, Armageddon. It could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. Or it could, you know, that's why we wake and look out. No guarantees in this life, but some bonuses like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening. So I would just say at, 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 as we uh, do that, kind of trying to brighten our inner world by being in the moment, you know, experiencing that delicious aspect and, 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 and also kind of seeing hope, right? So why don't we take a moment here at the end, and I'm just going to do a, a small guided imagery with you. So if you want to just close your eyes, take a nice deep breath, deep down into your diaphragm, and just let the breath out slowly, slowly, slowly let the breath out, letting your body give in to gravity. Your whole body feels warm and heavy and relaxed. That your body is calm and relaxed, your mind alert and awake. And just imagine yourself taking that some journey as you kind of take a path and you go into some favorite place that feels safe and calm to you. And as you explore this secret place of beauty and safety, let your senses come alive. Maybe you're touching the bark of a tree or feeling sand sift through your fingers or feeling smooth, slippery water in a stream. Just take some time to explore with touch. Maybe you're aware of the fragrance of flowers blooming or just the smell of aromas in the wind, the smell of rain, air after the rain. Maybe there's something to taste like the salt water spray or a blackberry or blueberry. The colors vivid and clear. Some are warm and inviting. Perhaps you hear a sound of a bird or a cricket. Water running wind through the trees. And just take some time to ask for help in solving a problem. Maybe thinking about something that's been on your mind. Here you are in this place with all these amazing signs of life around you. 
and let them speak to you. Let them help you as you think about this problem or this sort of thing you're to talk, thinking about or worrying about or, or just this place your energy grows, your mind settles. You might even imagine have a conversation with the wisdom of something here. Wind speaks to you, the trees, the water, the sky. We just listen and share. And speak with the wisdom of the things here in the center of your life and your safe place. And just take whatever time you need to just allow yourself to take whatever this place, these energy beings have to offer you. Maybe it's just feeling a little better, a little fresher, a little more hopeful. Maybe you have an aha. And you can take this with you, and you know that you can go to this place anytime in your mind, in your heart, or in, in person. You know that you can take the energy and calm of this place with you in your body and mind and into your waking state. You just allow yourself to come back into this space, aware of your breathing and the sounds around you, paying attention to your body. You might want to stretch your hands, your fingers, your body. Just coming back into the space. Noticing maybe how more relaxed and calm your body and mind feel, more relaxed and energized. Okay. So hopefully as you think about this process, and I know this isn't new to you, but maybe as it was for me, it was a reminder. There's a reminder how powerful the sensory experience of the moment is. How much power it has to help us find balance and hope. And maybe a different sense of peace in our lives as we face whatever is there for us. So I hope that what I would hope for you is that you keep having more and more delicious moments. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs>